you. Thank you very much. Looking forward to that challenge. So I'd like to welcome to the stage a speaker for our next talk, Replacing Baseload Coal and Gas for Power Generation. And we have coming to the stage, Professor David Healy from Keele University. Over to you. Thank you. Well, firstly, we'll get rid of that picture. Um, afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name's David, uh, excuse me, I've got a bit of a frog, nothing to worry about, I've been checked. Um, I'm really looking forward to speaking for the next 15, 20 minutes, but the subject is so big, I'm going to be sprinting through some issues that, and not doing them justice, if I'm honest. So I hope if there's anything that I say that, oh, uh, that, that you want to follow up on, or you have multiple questions, because I hopefully have a couple of minutes at the end for a few questions. Uh, please reach out to me. Uh, some of these issues I've been working on for, well, longer than many of people uh, in the audience have been around. Um, so um, base, base load uh, and renewables, okay? It, it, it's basically um, an issue of, and this is, by the way, I should say this, I'm not representing any opinions of Keele University, uh, my wife or anyone else. This is, <laughs> this is, this is all me. So um, yeah, um, the issue is uh, many, as, as we probably all know in the room, lots of the things I'm going to touch on here, we've known about for many, many years. Um, we're fighting and battling uh, vested interests policy, regulation that has been built around those vested interests. And we're breaking them down, um, but not quickly enough. So what I'm going to do is, is firstly paint a pretty negative picture, but there is, I think, some light at the end of the tunnel. So that's me. I, I, have, to, I have to mention who I am because I'm not a professor. Um, I'm, that was an honorary. Uh, I, I was so, I mean, I was, I still find it hard that I see that up on the screen, but um, I work at Keele University. I've been doing uh, part on a part-time basis since 2016, but I helped them win about 20, 30 million of funding to build out a digital smart energy system across the whole campus in 2017. And as a result, they honored me with that title. Um, I do the odd lecture every now and then, but uh, that's about it. Um, but what I can say is that if anyone's interested in how digital technologies can accelerate decarbonisation of energy systems, reach out to Keel, reach out to me, come and visit us. There's a, a system that has been built there that is representative of everything I'm going to talk about, but it actually does the job. It decarbonises what is a basically a small town. Keel is the biggest universe, single university campus in the UK. And it's built on two hills. It represents the demographic and topology of a small town. So if, any, if, if anyone really wants to get into it and, and look at it in a practical way, do come and visit us. Um, so global energy transition, the problems with, that we've got facing us with regular, all number ones, I've just noticed. They're all as important as each other. I don't know how that happened. Um, smart local energy system is the answer. We'll, we'll get to that in the end and, and I'll reference some case studies. Or maybe not. So, is, is, put your hand up if you've heard this before, the four Ds. Wow, I can finish very early. So, so this, is, this is basically where we're heading. And the reason we're heading there is if you look at the system that is operated today in the UK, the US, wherever, 75% um, of it is done, okay? So if you have a power outage, as we did where I live uh, in uh, North Manchester a few weeks ago, the way the distribution company finds out where to go and fix it is it triangulates all the complaints that are received over the phone. Okay, that's how it's done. Because there's no intelligence in the street where you live, okay? There's no intelligence in the substation that supplies your house, okay? That has got to change. And once it changes, 
all the beneficial economics of renewable energy, distributed renewable energy, that are vastly uh, more attractive than the model that we have today uh, can be employed and we can realize the benefits. So this is, again, th things that you know. Renewable costs are, are still uh, falling significantly. Uh, storage costs are, are falling significantly. My microphone's falling, please. Um, Digitalization of energy, however, can increase the value proposition of all these technologies. Um, I think it was Christoph who mentioned about heat being a, a huge, this morning, a huge issue in, in realizing decarbonization of energy. Absolutely. Digital electric, um, sorry, electric uh, sourced heat can drive that even faster. And, and the benefits are also that you can reduce the end cost of energy for consumers. And this is, this is basically the problem we're facing. The wholesale energy price of gas is the dark uh, uh, color that is spiking all over the place. The actual localized cost of energy from uh, wind and solar is at the bottom. And those costs are not being reflected in what you pay to your energy supplier. That's the problem. Because our electricity prices are all tied into the spot markets for gas, global spot markets. And so when, and don't let anyone tell you this is all the fault of Putin and Ukraine. It's had an impact, but this has been a problem. There was a, a, a report published that the government sponsored in 2017, the cost of energy, you know, you know that? Okay, Dieter Helm, great guy. Um, if anyone's interested, Google his interview with the Lord Parliamentary Committee on Energy in May and watch him rip a hole in, in the whole process. Because a lot of these problems were um, highlighted in his report in 2017, nothing's been done. And there were problems. The same problems were around way before that as well. Localized energy systems, okay, used, using digital technologies to match local supply with local demand and sheltering, as a result, consumers from global energy markets. That, that's where we're going, hopefully. We've been going there for as long as I've been around, but, but very, very slowly. But the one thing about the energy crisis that's, uh, that we're suffering from at the moment is it might now start to accelerate. Ofgem uh, are consulting on how to restructure the industry around local energy service provision. I'm, I apologize for racing through these, but you know, it, like I say, if you look at them, you, you, you'll be able to get the slides very soon. Um, and you have questions or you want to follow up, like I say, please. Please come back to me. There, are t there were 12 studies that have just been completed that were funded by government. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, that have just been completed. Two years each study uh, took. Um, and the idea was to understand how the economics of local energy systems could be applied to different demographic areas of the UK that represented different types of topology, different types of network requirements, et cetera. Uh, those results are just now coming out. They're a bit, a bit late, if I'm honest, but um, they're very interesting and a very good source of data if you're interested in this particular issue. Um, sorry, pressing the wrong button, Give, bear with me. Oh, so the thing to remember about the implementation of distributed energy that is controlled and managed digitally and matching that supply with local demand is that it's been around for decades at transmission level, but nobody's ever invested or incentivized the regulatory control DNOs to invest in the distribution networks in the same way. However, you can apply the same principles to your own home. And ultimately, what you're doing is you're turning a top-down system into a bottom-up system. And as a result, 
that the amounts that people like, there's no one from National Grid in the room, is it? Okay. The, 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 the billions that National Grid are presently trying to get off Jim to commit to their business for the next five years would, in a, to a great degree, disappear. If we all managed our own energy demands locally more effectively and in the home more effectively. So. Oh, I see what's happening. Ah, here we go. So this was a study done by Siemens um, in 2021, I think it was. And basically all it's doing is it's showing that if you, if you match various different disparate demand profiles, but digitally, digitally control them as a system, you can reduce the peak demand across that uh, particular set of customers dramatically. Now, obviously, that it changes with the types of profiles of the customer's concern, the particular location, the type of energy they need. Um, and the type of energy that's available. But ultimately, this is what digitalization of local energy systems creates. The national UK system, as, as it stands at the moment, is functioning to satisfy peak demand, which happens probably only four or five minutes every week. That demand, that whole national network and the whole uh, centralized generation uh, fleet is designed to satisfy that peak demand. If you can, if you can manage localized demand more effectively, then that national requirement drops significantly. And we all benefit, not just from a, a, the point of view of energy costs, but also we can, it, we can implement and adopt renewable energy that much more quickly. So the, these are the projects that I've been involved in uh, directly over the last few years to, to test out uh, what I've just described uh, much more quickly than I should have, but um, ultimately to then demonstrate how at a local level investments can generate uh, very attractive returns whilst we re basically turn the system on its head. 75 to 80 percent of all local authorities have now declared a climate emergency. I sit on Durham County Council's Climate Emergency Board. I sit on the GM Sit Greater Manchester Council's equivalent. Um, and I've worked with a number of other local authorities. They've set targets, but to be perfectly honest, it's going to be almost impossible for them to satisfy those targets unless we begin to invest in distributed renewable energy that can build out bottom-up systems in the way I've described. Greater Manchester have just published, uh, and if you go on their website, you'll find it uh, only last week, their plans for 10 different local area energy plans for each one of the 10 district councils, together with an overarching proposition for a local energy market. Now, this is very similar to the 12 trials that I referenced on the pre, uh, one of the previous slides. But this is a business as usual proposition. This is something that they have set up a, an energy procurement framework that's valued at 350 million in the first phase to get it kicked off. And this is a similar proposition that is actually now being built out in Bristol. Uh, Bristol City Leap is, is what it's called. It's been in the press a lot. But I, I was involved in, for a couple of years, working for Engie, trying to win that procurement. In the end, they pulled out at the very last minute, but that's another story. But, but Vattenfall, is that right? Yeah, Vattenfall and Amoresco, if, I'm, if I'm, my memory is right, are the ones that are building this out. And it's very similar to the Greater Manchester proposition. It's basically a localized energy system building out renewable, wind, solar, uh, district heating systems, and integrating them all together to offer lower cost energy, low cost sustainable energy to the whole of the city. 
So, oh dear, just about there. What's the future? If, if what we've spent is the, uh, and probably most of my 30 years in the industry, moving towards this goal of uh, introducing distributed renewable energy because it offers lower cost sustainable solutions than the existing model, what, what are we gonna get there? Well, the, the thing about an energy crisis, and this is something uh, Dieter Helm uh, said in the interview I mentioned with the parliamentary committee, we can use it to, to, to really uh, accelerate some of our intentions over and above the very slow progress we've seen to date. If you, there are some shining examples. I, I would, um, I would uh, recommend you look at, for example, Western Australia, where they're actually tearing down the equivalent of the whole UK's national grid, tearing down the poles, the wires, and building out low, what they call standalone power systems. But it's, a, it's a basically using renewable energy at a distributed level and managing it digitally to get them off the grid and sourcing the energy close to the required demand. And that's the same premise that we're talking about implementing now in the UK in terms of smart local energy systems. Digital technologies, the cost of digital technologies, renewable technologies are all continuing to fall. All we're talking about doing at the moment is pressing the government, whichever one it is, um, by the time we fin I finish this presentation, uh, to adopt these technologies and move forward with regulatory and policy change. And, and the thing about this energy crisis is we might finally get there because there's very limited options for them to look at to be able to address the short to medium term demands of the energy crisis. So fingers crossed, um, this, this revolution, this move to smart local energy systems might actually happen uh, before I hang up my boots. So I've not got that much time left. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, please. Or do I have to choose? No, I'll let the young lady choose. Uh, great talk. Thank you very much, David. You mentioned low cost a lot of the time there. I'm just thinking from an end consumer perspective, there's quite a lot of high cost investments to be made, getting that electric car, B2G charges of several thousand pounds, heat pump, retrofit, all of that. Is there um, a solution to that that we're seeing that will enable us to achieve this digital? So I was, I was in um, a meeting yesterday. I won't mention the energy company, but it was a very big energy company. And their interest is to look at how to decarbonize social housing, but in a way which will also reduce energy costs. And ultimately, what, what I presented to them was, if you implement distributed energy, solar, uh, heat pumps, with, a, with the right mechanisms to control the, the generation of energy at the source of demand. So in, in a nutshell, what you're doing is you're sharing access for the social, social housing estate to batteries, solar panels. They're not on every roof. But as a, within that estate, they can all access the benefits. Ultimately, what you do, you can present a business case for the investment in the infrastructure that pays back because you can aggregate a lot of energy and monetize it in flexibility and balancing markets while still satisfying the energy needs of the social housing estate itself. Now, that's without EVs. If you get to the point of integrating EVs into that system, where those batteries alone can support the demands of a house for a day, if they're fully charged on their own, they have much more capacity than a, uh, a Tesla battery that you put in the power pack, the power wall, sorry, excuse me. Um, then you can really start to show that you can almost get to self-sufficiency for large parts of the year 
for that housing estate and, and the energy bills can be reduced. I mean, I'd, we were showing they could reduce by 70% yesterday, not for the whole year, but averaged below 50%. So it can be done, but it needs a rethink of the model that's being uh, implemented and operated at the moment. Um, thank you, David. As a former octopus, uh, it's always good to see the centralized energy um, being defended. Um, and currently working for a company focused on AI and how important is data for us. Um, thinking, I, I would like to hear a little bit on the distribution network operators in the way that we have the business models today. They have a total incentive of deploying more hardware than being providing the service of this transition that we want them to be as a distribution service operator, where they are smart and they utilize the data in a more effective way to, to do that. And I think that is the big barrier for the social housing models that we have in terms of access of the data and the difference from the moment that if you utilize it, the, the grid network for a second, you incur, you reduce your business model by 70% of competitiveness uh, in this market. So I want to hear like this perspective of how we integrate this data and how third party providers of um, expertise in AI can be, uh, can leverage this competition for, for aggregators and households. The, there was a new, there was a, a new chairman who was um, brought into Ofgem about four years ago. Um, Martin Kay, great guy, used to be at Ofcom. And um, the f after a few weeks, they invited me in and I presented to the whole Ofgem management team. And there was only one thing I really presented on, which was more or less exactly what you've just described. How do you incentivize DNOs to stop investing in capital networks and implement technology that can operate the existing capital networks much more effectively? Got a long story short, they've not done it. But at the moment, they're in negotiation over the business plans for the next five years. And there's a lot of lobbying going on. Um, what the outcome will be, I don't know. But the issue of constraints, which is this building more capital networks to get around the fact there's bottlenecks in the network, they have said that they're going to incentivize them to build out intelligence first. Fingers crossed. There is a guy really. If, if I'm, I'm just, afraid we're out of time, well, David. Sorry about that. I'm going to come over and answer your question. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your Fantastic. time. Thank, Thank you so much.